This is CBS 4 News at 5. Right now at 5, the nationwide manhunt is over. We have arrested Cesar Sayoc in connection with this investigation. The suspected mail bomber captured in plantation. Political violence or the threat of violence is antithetical to our vigorous system of self-government. Tonight, piecing together the investigation. These are not hoax devices. That led to an arrest for a series of explosive devices. This is a national developing story, and the focus is right here in South Florida. Thank you for joining us. I'm Elliot Rodriguez. And I'm Rudy Bey Shabazi. Cesar Sayak was arrested at an AutoZone store in Plantation just after 1030 this morning. Federal investigators say he is the lone suspect, and he is now facing five federal crimes. We have CBS 4 News live team coverage over the next 90 minutes of news, and we begin with CBS 4's Ted Scouten. He is live in Plantation, where Sayak was taken into custody. Yeah, Rudaban Elliott, still a lot of questions here as to why he ended up at this auto zone. That's one of the big questions that at this point the FBI has not addressed that. Uh, take a look tonight. 56 year old Caesar Sayak is in FBI custody. We understand that he uh, may have an attorney now and is not talking anymore, but uh, he is with the FBI. He was arrested uh, here this morning at the auto zone store. That flash on the top of your screen appears to be a flashbang going off just moments before the FBI took 56 year old Caesar Sayak of Aventura into custody in an AutoZone parking lot on State Road 7 in Plantation. Yeah, we just took him into custody. Um, we're concerned reference signal 46. People all over the area heard that loud bang. As I turned, I heard a very loud bang. Um, it absolutely appeared to be uh, a flashbang. Noticed probably 40, 50 law enforcement officers come out from all different directions. Sayak was arrested by his van. It's plastered with pro-Trump, anti-Democrat stickers. The FBI loaded that van onto its flatbed to bring it to their Miramar headquarters for analysis. Meanwhile, an FBI agent remained inside the auto zone trying to get more information from clerks. These are not hoax devices. FBI Director Christopher Ray confirmed these were actual pipe bombs. He would not get into what a possible motive was. Each had a return address of South Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Her office also received one after it was returned because of a bad address. Investigators said they were led to Sayak from a fingerprint left on one of 13 devices he suspected of sending. They uncovered a latent fingerprint from one of the envelopes containing an IED that had been sent to Congresswoman Maxine Waters. We have confirmed this fingerprint is that of Cesar Sayak. He said investigators also came up with a DNA link. There is also a possible DNA connection between samples collected from pieces of two different IEDs mailed in separate envelopes and a sample previously collected from Sayak in connection with an earlier arrest down in Florida. And the FBI also put out an ominous warning saying that we may not be out of the woods yet. They said we still don't know if there's possibly more of those devices in the mail right now. Tonight, he is facing five, five charges. If convicted, he could be uh, spent 48 years in federal prison. Live in Plantation, Ted Scout, CBS 4 News. All right, Ted, thanks a lot. Our CBS 4 News team live team coverage moves to CBS 4's David Sutta. He is live at FBI headquarters in Miramar with what we've learned this afternoon about Cesar Sayoc's criminal history. David. Yeah, it's that criminal history that actually links this whole case together and solved it for the FBI. Uh, Cesar was brought here to this location at the FBI headquarters in Miramar around 11 o'clock today. If you take one look online, you put his name in the search box, you will clear, clearly, quickly see that he is right wing, that he is a Trump supporter, that he's attended rallies, uh, and that he has actually gone to the Mar-a-Lago estate and posed for pictures in front of that. Everybody knew where he stood politically. But those that we're talking to today are not sure that he was capable of carrying out terrorism. As the Attorney General has confirmed, we have arrested Cesar Sayoc in connection with this investigation. 56-year-old Cesar Sayoc lives in Aventura. He's held a number of jobs over the years as an inspiring entrepreneur. On social media, he routinely posted right-wing comments and photos. He went to Donald Trump rallies. He constantly bashed Democrats. If he drove by you, you could not miss him. His van covered in right-wing stickers. Those who knew him well say he was certainly passionate about politics. Every conversation we ever had rolled right back into politics, no matter what subject it started on. It was always 
is all around some politics. Justin Humberger speaking to us by phone used Tayok as a business manager a couple years ago. His views are, yes, very Republican and very, very right-leaning, but it's never come to like an where he's threatened anybody or an act of violence. He's like, these people should die because of their views or the policies they're instating. Humberger sent us screenshots of texts Sayok had sent him recently, one featuring a photo of him holding an I Voted sticker and making a statement supporting Republican candidates Rick Scott and Ron DeSantis. In another text, Sayok actually sent a link to a news story about one of the pipe bombs he allegedly sent to a Democratic supporter, George Soros. I don't expect I don't expect him to have the technical skill to, to create a device that to, to kill people. Sayok has a history of arrest, including grand theft, battery, and possession of prescription drugs with intent to sell. In 2002, he was arrested when, according to police, he, quote, threatened to blow up FPL and that it would be worse than September 11th. He also threatened something would happen to the FPL representative if they cut his electricity. Sayok was sentenced to one year of probation. Ultimately, its fingerprints recorded during those previous arrests that linked him to the pipe bomb packages. Once a fingerprint was found on one of those devices and run, the FBI we're on to him. And we're still getting developing details. CNN is now reporting that Sayok was apparently had been kicked out of his parents' home in Aventura and was actually living in that van that was covered in all of the Trump uh, stickers and whatnot. We're also learning that he was cooperating initially with FBI investigators, telling them, quote, that the pipe bombs wouldn't have hurt anyone and that he didn't want to hurt anyone. A short time later, though, according to CNN, he stopped cooperating with the FBI investigators and has retained an attorney and is no longer cooperating. That's the very latest here in Miramar. I'm David Sutter, CBS 4 News. David, thank you. And from David, our team coverage moves to CBS 4's Peter Dench. Peter is live for us tonight in Aventura, where he spoke with people who know Sayak and his mother. Peter. Well, Elliot Ruta Bay, this is the mail bomb suspect's last known address. It has been a very busy place today. Now, there has been a new development here in the past hour from Chopper 4. We see FBI agents leaving this condominium at Aventura. A 20th floor condominium had been listed as the suspect's last known address. It's where his mother lives. She's a well-known member of the board of directors. Records show this condominium complex at Northeast 181st Street and 31st Court in Aventura is where 56-year-old mail bomb suspect Cesar Sayoc used to live. It was his recorded address until two years ago in this apartment, number 2016. Condo resident Daniel Oshinsalager lives on the 20th floor as well, and he took us to that apartment where we tried to see if anyone was at home. While no one was there, many here were talking about the arrest of Caesar Sayoc. It's very sad. It's very sad. While no one I spoke with had seen Sayoc, it seemed many condo owners know his mother, Madeline Giardello. And what is she She's like? She's a very nice lady. She's so perfect. I'm in shock right now uh -huh. because I did not know any of this information. I know yeah. Madeline as the president or used to be the president. Sayok's mother had been president of the condo association and is still on the board of directors. The mother has served that building well for the last 18 years on the board. She's been president of the board for a number of years, and uh, she's a nice woman. I mean, she just, uh, you know, this is just a, a happenstance that this is her, uh, allegedly her son. So. What are your feelings about this whole thing, what the son is allegedly it's tied crazy. to? It's crazy. I don't know. I never saw him, but, you know, it's crazy. It's absolutely unbelievable. What strikes you the most about this, that he could be possibly tied to what's happening here? These <laughs> Sometimes you never know what your kids are going to do, and you never know, you know, what could possibly be uh, they could be involved in. That's and you a, hadn't seen him around here that much. Have you seen I've never seen him. I've never seen him. Never seen him. Never now, we tried to reach Ayok's mother, but we were told that she was hospitalized for surgery. Condo residents here, some of them told us that FBI agents had also been here earlier this week, but we could not confirm that and determine if, in fact, it was connected to Sayok. We're live in Aventura. Peter Dench, CBS 4 News.
All right, Peter, thanks a lot. And joining us now is CBS 4's Jim DeFeedy, who's been working his sources all day long. And uh, Jim, you've got some new information on a case, a previous case involving a bomb threat and Caesar say So sure, you heard uh, David Sutter reference the 2002 case in which uh, he was accused of and actually pled guilty to making threats to blow up an FPNL building here in Miami-Dade. The idea was that uh, he was uh, upset over a high FPL bill and that he promised and vowed that it would be worse than 9-11. We, I just got off the phone less than a half an hour ago with the detective who actually arrested Sayak in 2002. We're not releasing his name. He's asked that not. He's retired. He says that, you know, in some ways he wasn't surprised to hear Sayok's name come back up. He says often the, in these sorts of cases, they do circle around back up, and that's the nature of law enforcement. He says that though he remembered the name when he started seeing it on CNN. He didn't recognize the picture, but he knew the name right away and then started getting phone calls from folks. One thing he wouldn't didn't want to discuss with me was whether or not the FBI has been in touch with him to talk about his experiences with Sayok back in 2002. I think it's a safe bet they probably have been. Wow. Okay. So we saw the images uh, from above of the van just plastered with stickers. What can you tell us about the van? What investigators are going to be looking at? So what, well, a couple. So let's talk. Let's take the second part first. The part with regard to what the investigators will be looking for. Every indication now seems to be that he was at least spending an inordinate amount of time, if not actually living inside his van. If that's the case, then that van becomes very critical because you would imagine that there may be some of the elements that used in these in these devices may be within that van. They wrapped it up. Once they were secure and safe that there was nothing explosive that they were going to have to deal with with the van, they took it away. Look, it would not shock me if that van ends up on a cargo plane and ends up in Quantico to be fully processed by the FBI technicians up there. Now, let's talk about the van more in general, including the political stickers on the side of it. One of the things that's become amazing to me in just the past few hours since, since those images of the van in the parking lot were first broadcast is how many people have now step forward saying, yes, I remember seeing that van. We've got sightings at Aventura. We've got sightings at a VFW in Fort Lauderdale. People are sending me pictures they've taken of the van, time stamped over the past year. So it became one of these things where people were drawn to this van because of the outrageous things on there. There are crosshairs, you know, pictures of Hillary Clinton with crosshairs on them, pictures of Barack Obama with crosshairs, some very disturbing imagery on there. And yet the nature of our political discourse now is that this was seen as something to to sort of take pictures of and say hey look at this this is kind of bizarre that's where we've come as a society and that's what's particularly troubling yeah, that should have sounded an alarm now in retrospect Jim let me ask you about all this evidence that the agents mm -hmm. are going to have now with these 13 packages well that, look so it's an amazing thing what what they can do the bomb technicians in terms of being able to analyze these packages not only can they tie them together but to understand the signatures of the of the bomber as I understand it, the very first package, the one sent to George Soros, was destroyed, which is not uncommon in cases. What you end up doing is, if you have a device that you're concerned about, you explode it, you render it harmless by actually blowing it up. Once they realized they had a pattern, once they realized that this was a series of things, then it became a priority for the federal agents to preserve the packages as much as possible. And that's what they did, and that's what led to the break in the case. Fingerprints were found. DNA evidence is being, is being analyzed. All those sorts of things. The pieces of the bomb itself will likely, they'll find other pieces of it probably associated with SIAC to build their case. And quickly, we have to run, but why not call this terrorism? Why are they not... Uh declaring this an act of terrorism right now premature? Well, look, I, I'm, I, I think we should be giving full credit to the Department of Justice and the FBI and all the agencies, the Joint Terrorism Task Force that worked on this. Look, I'm, I'm okay with if they want to take a moment to sort of understand the political motivations of the person. We shouldn't jump to a conclusion just because of what he had written on the side of his van, that that's what was motivating him. You know, there, there's, there, so let's take this a step at a time. I'm, I'm all in favor of doing that, but eventually I do think we're likely to end up in that area. Look, this was designed to elicit fear. Even if you accept what David Sutter said, some of the reporting talking about how his plan was not necessarily to hurt people, it was certainly designed to scare people. And that's what terrorism does. It certainly did. All right, uh, Jim, thank you very much for your insight. Now, throughout the week, a total of 13 suspicious packages were discovered. Here's a map of where the devices were found from New York to South Florida to California and several states in between. All of the people targeted are prominent 
critics of President Trump. Now, it all began Monday afternoon when police say a package was found in a mailbox outside the home of billionaire George Soros in upstate New York. Wednesday morning, the FBI announced similar looking packages were found outside the upstate New York home of former President Bill Clinton, as well as the Washington, D.C. residence of former President Barack Obama. And a third package was found here in South Florida outside the Sunrise office of Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Now, yesterday, a bomb squad removed the suspicious package found outside actor Robert De Niro's restaurant in New York City. Shortly after that, two packages addressed to former Vice President Joe Biden were found at two separate postal facilities in Delaware. And just this morning, a Midtown Manhattan post office surrounded by police after a suspicious package was found addressed to former intelligence director James Clapper. And around the same time, Chopper 4 was over the scene in Opelika, where another device was found addressed to Senator Cory Booker. Just this afternoon, federal law enforcement confirming a suspicious package was found at a post office in Sacramento, California. That one addressed to Senator Kamala Harris. And another package was intercepted near San Francisco, addressed to Tom Steyer, the billionaire activist and Democrat. All right, our team coverage moves now to Opelika and CBS 4's Gary Nelson. He has more on what was found at the mail processing facility there. Gary. Well, now we heard earlier that this fellow, this suspect, was talking with the FBI apparently quite freely for a while before he finally lawyered up. Did he, in fact, tell them that there are, in fact, more devices still in the mail? We heard the suggestion that there might be at a news conference this afternoon with the attorney general and the director of the FBI. We'll take a look over here behind me. You can see. Miami-Dade Police Bomb Squad units are on the scene here at this Opelika Mail Processing Center. They arrived here just a couple of hours or so after this fellow was taken into custody. Miami-Dade Police and Bomb Squad members back at an Opelika Mail Processing Center scarcely three hours after the suspect in the bomb device mailings was captured. It is at this mail sorting center that investigators believe some, maybe all, of the devices were processed and sent on their way. Dogs and Bomb Squad teams spent much of Thursday and overnight scouring the massive mail facility. In a news conference after the suspect's arrest, the FBI director cautioned there might be more devices still, well, in the mail. Today's arrest doesn't mean we're all out of the woods. There may be other packages in transit now. Overnight, a device was intercepted at the center addressed to a Democratic New Jersey senator who's been critical of President Trump. And Friday, with the suspect in custody, bomb experts returned to the mail center in Opelika, presumably wanting to find any more explosive devices that may have made their way to it. potentially a dangerous explosive devices. They stressed the federal spokespersons in their news conference this afternoon that these are not hoax devices, that they are in fact explosive items and can hurt people. For now, we're live in Opelika, Gary Nelson, CBS 4 News. Gary, thank you. Our coverage of this still developing story is not over. Still to come, President Trump's response to the arrest of Caesar Sayoc. That's next. Also, the suspected bomber's extensive social media life. We dive in, taking a closer look at his political posts at 530 as part of our CBS 4 News live team coverage. CBS 4 News at 5. We'll be right back.
All right, this just into us. Uh, we have uh, the president responding to reporters before heading to North Carolina. Yeah, he was asked if he should tone down the temperature of the speeches he's been given, and this is what he had to say just moments ago. Well, I think I've been toned down. You want to know the truth? I could really tone it up uh, because, as you know, the media has been extremely unfair to me and to the Republican Party. I think the media has been very, very unfair in terms of the Republican Party and the way it's been covered. And uh, they understand that. They write articles about that. Many of them admit that. But the media has been unbelievably unfair to Republicans, conservatives, and, uh, and certainly to me. But with all of that being said, we're winning. So I like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Vice President Mike Pence also reacting to the arrest on Twitter somewhat differently, saying, We commend the FBI, Secret Service, and all law enforcement for the swift apprehension of a suspect mailing devices to high-profile figures. The President of the United States made clear we will prosecute anyone responsible to the fullest extent of the law. Acts or threats of violence have no place in our society. Our coverage doesn't end here. We'll have a closer look at Cesar Sayoc's social media profile as part of our extensive team coverage ahead on CBS 4 News at 530. And now at 5, as you've noticed, South Florida is at the center of this major national story tonight. And we have the opportunity now to speak with CBS Evening News anchor Jeff Glor. Jeff, good to see you. And you will be here next week as part of your tour of the battleground states. Do you think events of this week will have an impact on what happens in November? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, you know, listen, uh, we're, first of all, I look forward to, to being there and, and joining you guys um, in studio there on Monday. We're going to broadcast the evening news from Miami on Monday night. It was very important for us to get to Florida uh, because it's uh, plays such a huge role in not just this election, but all elections at this point. But yeah, do I think people are looking? I mean, there's if you look at what what was on this guy's van, it was clearly some political messages, some political stickers. Um, so in that sense, he was very partisan. What what led him to do this? We don't know right now, but we do have, as you do, uh, correspondents and reporters all over South Florida looking into this. Jeff, tell us about your coverage. You'll be talking to voters here. What are you hoping to find out? I think we're, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, what 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 Floridians are concerned about right now, um, and especially people in your area. So we're going to do a focus group with a with a wide range, diverse group of voters. Um, already spoken to them a little bit. You, you can see how engaged people are, not just across the country, but in Florida right now. Um, it's a very hot election, and a lot of people are very interested to talk about this and very interested um, in voting. So we'll present all that to you on Monday night's evening news. It is a hot election. We're in the middle of early voting here in South Florida, and we're seeing lines like we've never seen before for a midterm. So it'll be interesting to see what you find out when you get here, Jeff. All right, Jeff, good to see you. All right, we'll looking see forward you to see you guys. Us too. And Jeff and the sure. CBS Evening News team will have extensive coverage of the explosive devices arrest tonight on the CBS Evening News. That's at 6 30 after CBS 4 News at now, CBS4 Weather with meteorologist Lisette Gonzalez. Alisa, weather will be nicer when Jeff is in town on Monday to broadcast the evening news from here in South Florida. It was a hot one today. We're seeing some clouds and sunshine from our Fort Lauderdale camera. Miami, a degree shy of the record with 89 for a high today. Fort Lauderdale, 88 Key West, 87. And temperatures are still very warm with the upper 80s in Broward and Dade and down through the Keys. The wind shifting out of the southwest and picking up its breezy out there. 12, 18 miles an hour ahead of this front that is knocking on our door behind it already. Some cooler, drier filtering in across the panhandle, and that front is going to continue to slide down the state. Now, as it pushes through tomorrow morning, we could see some scattered showers, possibly through midday. And then once we get that front to clear, especially by Saturday night into Sunday, temperatures will be dropping and we'll see lows in the 60s. And then another weak cold front is set to arrive early next week. Now, tonight, we'll Will still be mild and clouds will build 74 with the chance of spotty showers. Small craft caution in place tonight due to those winds out of the southwest 10 to 20 knots, seas 2 to 3, a light chop on the bays. Tomorrow, again, scattered showers, mostly for the first half of the day, warm, mostly sunny with 88 degrees. And then we'll enjoy that cooler start Sunday morning with the 60s, the high around 80, and pleasant sunshine, lower humidity. Could be even a little cooler Monday morning with the mid 60s, highs in the low 80s, and we'll stay comfortable. Through 
through your Tuesday morning with the upper 60s, breezy sunshine, 83. For our next Wednesday, Halloween, temperatures will creep up a little bit warmer, even warmer by late next week. Thank you very much. Still to come, more extensive coverage of the arrest and plantation. A man the FBI says was responsible for mailing pipe bombs to critics of President Trump. The latest on the investigation at 530. It's sickening that this could be happening anywhere, but, you know, obviously being a representative of this community and being a, a, a person who is of this community, raising my children in this community, um, it's, it's, it's gut-wrenching. Also, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, the congresswoman who had her office's return address used by the alleged bomber, speaks out about the headline-making incident. And we're following other breaking news, including the search for a burglar who took advantage of a couple's forgetfulness. The crime on camera is next. Thank you. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Now five cameras were rolling when police say a man broke into a home in Miami. Home surveillance video shows the man walking up to the home on the 1600 block of McCanopy Avenue and opening the front door last week. The homeowner told police he and his wife left in the morning and forgot to lock the front door. When he came back, he noticed his cell phone and money clip were gone, and that's when he checked the video and saw the man walk in and walk out. If you recognize him, call police. 
And now at 530, explosive device arrest. A man taken into federal custody at an auto parts store in Plantation. Tonight, the Department of Justice says Cesar Sayoc is the lone suspect. They say fingerprints on a package sent to California Representative Maxine Waters led them to the bombs. Now, over the last 24 hours, it's been a whirlwind of activity in South Florida, even as more devices are being discovered. CBS 4's Hillary Lane has more from New York, where one of those devices was found this morning. Elliot and Ruta Bay, the investigation continues here in New York. Earlier this morning, dozens of police responded to this post office behind me after a postal worker was sorting through the mail, saw a suspicious package, and immediately called 911. Law enforcement officials put a tarp over a van in Plantation, Florida, not far from where they took 56 year old Cesar Sayoc into custody in connection with a series of explosive devices sent to prominent Democrats and CNN this week. I want to focus for a moment on the amazing work of our folks at the FBI lab. Based on their initial analysis, they uncovered a latent fingerprint from one of the envelopes containing an IED that had been sent to Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Sayoc, a South Florida resident originally from New York, has an extensive criminal record. Social media shows him at Trump rallies, and the van was covered with anti-Democrat and pro-Trump stickers. President Trump condemned the violence and promised swift justice. These terrorizing acts are despicable and have no place in our country. More suspicious devices were found earlier on Friday, including one found at a postal facility here in Midtown Manhattan. It is very, very scary, and, and I think that we all have to be very, very careful. The package was addressed to former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, care of CNN. Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz was listed as the sender. Obviously, it's it's devastating, deeply disturbing to have my name uh, uh, you know, used in, in, in that way. Other devices found Friday targeted Senators Cory Booker and Kamala Harris and a prominent Democratic donor. The FBI says the devices are real and there may be more of them still out there. And the package found here in Manhattan was taken by the FBI to Quantico, Virginia, where the other packages are being investigated as well. In lower Manhattan, Hillary Lane, CBS 4 News. And our CBS 4 News team coverage moves now to Caesar Sayoc's social media profile. He was active across multiple platforms. CBS 4's Ty Russell has been looking at those accounts. So, Ty, what have you found? Ruta Bay Caesar Sayoc mostly posted about politics. He even shared conspiracy theories. But along with showing his support for President Trump and the Republican Party, Sayoc also wanted his friends and followers to know when it comes to Democrats, he didn't agree with them. On Facebook, you take a look at these people. You study these people. Whether inside at a rally or outside, Caesar Sayak proudly showed his support for President Trump. He wore a Make America Great Again hat in several pictures. On Twitter, Sayak expanded that support for all Republicans. He praised them and often wrote negatively about Democrats, like Democratic donor and businessman George Soros. Just last week, the FBI says a suspicious package with a device inside was found outside his home. It matches the ones sent to other Democrats. On social media, Sayak also discussed far-right conspiracy theories and those about former Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School student David Hogg. Sayak also claimed to be Native American. He started this tweet from nearly two weeks ago stating, We unconquered Seminole Tribe, Hard Rock, millions of our customers. Today, the Seminole Tribe, Seminole Gaming, and Hard Rock International told CBS4 there's no evidence Sayak was a member or employee. On LinkedIn, Sayak described himself as a promoter, booking agent, owner, and choreographer. Other pictures show the pipe bomb suspect at the gym or outside a Thai boxing center. The suspect's Facebook page was taken down today following users flagging posts. Now, the Facebook detection system also found violations of community standards. In the control room, Ty Russell, CBS4 News. Thank you. Investigators first turned their attention in this case to South Florida on Wednesday when a suspicious device was found at Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz's Sunrise office. Now, her name was used as the return address on the envelope. CBS 4's Joe Murray caught up with the Congresswoman today and is live at her office in Sunrise with her reaction on what happened. Joan? 
Well, since the commotion on Wednesday, it has been business as usual back at the office, although the congresswoman did say today that there has been stepped up security. She said it was gut-wrenching when this investigation moved to South Florida, but she was always confident that there would be an arrest. I got to, um... At the moment the suspect was being cornered in plantation, Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz was greeting voters in central Hollywood, first casting her vote and then answering questions about her name and office being used as a return address on the pipe bomb mailings. We are not going to be knocked down by violence and by vitriol and by venom. On Wednesday, investigators exploded a suspicious package returned to Wasserman Schultz's Sunrise office and sealed off the building for a day. Wasserman Schultz was not there, only staff. I, I just want to share with you how heartbroken I was to have the, my incredible staff, who are taking care of the people I represent every single day, have to deal with that kind of danger and deal with that kind of her. After that, Schultz canceled an appearance, but later surfaced on Thursday at an event for a Democratic gubernatorial candidate, Andrew Gillum. We will never be cowed into submission by people who hate. Never. <laughs> never. Washerman Schultz said she could not explain why she was targeted but called on politicians to practice civility. None of us should be t treating our opponents like they are the enemy, and every one of us should lead by example. Late Friday, Wasserman Schultz issued a statement on the suspect's arrest, saying in part, I'm extremely grateful to the brave women and men in law enforcement who swiftly apprehended this suspect. I will remain in direct contact with law enforcement as this ongoing investigation continues. I'm confident that this attack on our democracy will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Wasserman Schultz said she could not comment on whether she has been targeted before this crisis. And she also said that she is very glad, though, that there is now stepped up security for herself and her staff. In Sunrise Tonight, Joan Murray, CBS 4 News. Joan, thank you for that. And our coverage of the arrest of Caesar Sayoc for explosive devices sent around the country does not end here. We'll have live team coverage fanned out across South Florida on CBS 4 News at 6. And you can find updated information as well as documents related to the case on our website, cbsmiami.com. We're also following other news tonight, including an inspection of President Trump's border wall. A section of that wall has been completed, and that story is next. 20 years after his murder, Matthew Shepard was laid to rest today. Why it took so long for that to happen, next. And NBC makes it official. Megyn Kelly's sh show is canceled, but this story is far from over. That's next.
Now to the Trump presidency and construction crews have finished building the first section of President Trump's long touted border wall. Workers placing a plaque on the 30 foot high wall in California. It has the names of President Trump and Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen. She toured the site today. Let me be clear, walls work. That's not my opinion. It's not a tagline. It's not a political statement. It's a fact. This comes as the president says he'll consider issuing an executive order to prevent migrants from seeking asylum at the border. A gay college student who was brutally murdered 20 years ago was finally laid to rest in the Washington National Cathedral. Hundreds gathered for the funeral of Matthew Shepard today. In 1998, he, Shepard, a gay University of Wyoming student, was beaten, tortured, and tied to a fence in near freezing temperatures. He was found by a passing bicyclist and later died in a hospital. For 20 years, his parents wanted to somehow memorialize his remains, but worried about vandalism. When they donated some of their son's items to the Smithsonian, the museum suggested a place of inclusivity, the National Cathedral. His father says his son would have approved. He always had a fondness for the church and the ceremony involved with it. Now, after the public National Cathedral service, the Shepherd family attended a private interment ceremony at Matthew's final resting place. Megyn Kelly's morning show on NBC has been canceled. The network made the announcement today, days after she made offensive comments about blackface Halloween costumes. She apologized for the comments she made on Wednesday's show, but yesterday and today the network aired reruns. Her lawyer, Brian Friedman, says she is still an employee at NBC and that discussions are underway about what's next for her. Next week, the 9 a.m. hour will be hosted by other Today Show co-anchors. Still to come, we'll introduce you to another hero among us, his story later at 5.30. And the story of Queen is brought to life on the big screen. Lisa Petrillo chats with the star of Bohemian Rhapsody. That's next. I'm meteorologist Aset Gonzalez near record heat today, still warm with the 80s, but check it out. Are you ready? Cold front is on the way behind it. 70s, even 60s, and we'll see lows in the 60s by Sunday morning. I'll break down the timing, the temperature trend, and my complete forecast ahead.
Now at 5.30, the timeless music of Queen is celebrated in the new movie Bohemian Rhapsody. It's a foot-stomping celebration of the band, their music, and their extraordinary lead singer, Freddie Mercury. Now the film chronicles their rise to fame through their big struggles and incredible successes. CBS 4's Lisa Petrillo sat down with the men who portray them on the big screen and each said they did not take one minute of their experience playing these men for granted. Bohemian Rhapsody is the ultimate sing-along, anthems of the 70s and 80s that still maintain the test of time. At the helm, Freddie Mercury, lead singer of Queen, a band that was groundbreaking, cross-generational, multicultural, and it became a global phenomenon. Cast in the lead as Freddie Mercury, Emmy Award-winning Rami Malek. All right! And did he just come into your body when you started this movie and the, just the mannerisms? Do you study him? How did that process There's this go? joy and mischief to him. There's this, you know, there's this childishness to him, but he is, he's also wry and sly and he's kind of all of the things you, you want to hang out with, with uh, <laughs> when you think of, I'm going out for a great night with that human being. Rami worked with a movement coach, stripping down every inch of Mercury's performance style, his magnetism, and his way around the stage. The mouth. Did you have a prosthetic? How did that, the, his mouth, your uh, teeth? How did yes, you? I had, that was, before the film was even financed or greenlit, I asked our producers, I said, just get me the teeth as early as possible. Because, to learn how to. Yeah, because that was going to be not only a task talking like him, but singing with those in. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I did that because by the end of the film, I almost felt naked when I didn't have them in. Mamma mia, mamma mia. Mamma mia, let me go. Starring alongside Rami in the band is Willem Lee as guitarist Brian May and Joe Mazzello on bass as John Deacon. All had to learn how to play their instruments and play them well. But there truly was a moment when we were doing Live Aid and we were running the whole thing all the way through the entire 20 minute set. Radio Gaga, I totally lost myself. I was just like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like, <laughs> this is such a privilege. <laughs> So I would go from, you know, singing and prancing across the stage as we were finishing a song to just ad-libbing with them, a lot of which sometimes, you know, makes the film. Feeling the vibe. Yeah, yeah feeling it. Bohemian Rhapsody opens in theaters November 1st. I'm Lisa Petrillo, CBS 4 News. What do you think? Looks pretty awesome. good, Awesome. Huh? Now I have We Are The Champions <laughs> in my head. I'm going to be thinking about it all night gonna long. I'm going to be singing it all night long. And I don't even want to watch a movie because the weather's been really nice. Yes, you, you want to be outside yeah. yes. this weekend, especially by Sunday, which will be spectacular. So We Are The Champions, weather-wise, this weekend, courtesy of a friend on the way. And already, it's beautiful out there, albeit very warm. It's been hot as we look from our Key West camera and our Broward camera in Fort Lauderdale, Miami. A degree shy of the record high of 90. We hit 89 degrees. Normally, we should be right around 85 fort lauderdale had a high of 88 key west 87 temperatures still warm out there near 90 in pompano beach and upper 80s across the rest of south florida and look at the wind kicking out of the southwest 12 18 miles an hour ahead of that front which is going to continue to slide down the state and behind it we're going to see that drier air but look at this low pressure system associated with the front yeah big nor'easter will be pounding states across the mid-atlantic through the northeast new england areas with heavy chilly rain strong winds coastal flooding and even some wet snow. But for us tonight, mild clouds building 74, the chance for spotty showers for boater small craft caution due to wind southwest 10 to 20 knot seas 2 to 3 and tomorrow scattered showers, especially for the first half of the day with the upper 80s warm and mostly sunny. So here it comes that fall front will be arriving tomorrow and by Sunday morning we're going to be enjoying the 60s. Look at the 50s and 40s around the rest of the state. The last time it was this cool is back in May. So yeah, get ready to enjoy uh, that sweater weather at least for the morning hours and Sunday 67 in the high 80 degrees with pleasant sunshine. We might be a little cooler Monday with 65 and low 80s continuing through Tuesday as a weak front's going to sweep through. But by Wednesday for Halloween, we'll wake up to 70, a little bit warmer, 84, even warmer with the upper 80s Thursday, Friday. So thank you. Still to come, an all new hero among us will introduce you to a World War II vet who served in the Navy as a gunner. Meet Victor Catalano next. And South Florida front and center in the race for governor again today. Republican nominee Ron DeSantis is in town. We'll have that new at six.
Now to an all new Hero Among Us. Every Friday here on CBS4, in partnership with the Florida Panthers, we put the spotlight on a Hero Among Us, men or women who have gone beyond the call of duty for our country. Tonight, uh, CBS4 anchor Maribel Rodriguez introduces us to a World War II veteran, Victor Catalano, who served in the United States Navy from 1943 to 1946. Just before his 18th birthday on November 5th, 1943, Victor Catalano enlisted in the Navy. His job was to protect the ship as a gunner on a small transport vessel. Catalano helped transport Army soldiers to Normandy Beach on D-Day, June 6th, 1944. And although decades have passed, it is a day Victor Catalano will never forget. Our job is to bomb the beaches, and then the soldiers on the board ship, we had to let them off, and the lieutenant commander says, well, fellas, we did our job, now you, you soldiers do your job. Who was that was a hero? The heroes were the soldiers. They were on the ground. He absolutely is a hero. Victor Catalano is a recipient of the Bronze Star Medal and French Legion of Honor, the highest French order of merit for military and civil merits. He was honored recently at a Florida Panthers game, a very emotional tribute for this World War II veteran who proudly stood up before a packed arena cheering him on. Taking it all in, he too thanks the fans for the overwhelming standing ovation with a thumbs up. On behalf of the Florida Panthers and CBS4, we would like to say thank you, Victor Catalano, for your service. Maribel Rodriguez, CBS 4 News. Aww. Very well deserved honor. Absolutely, very well deserved. Thank and you so much, Victor. That is CBS 4 News at 5:30. And here's what's next on CBS 4 News at 6. Caesar Sayoc, the suspected mail bomber, is in federal custody. We'll have details on his arrest in plantation and what brought him down. We're learning more about his troubled past. Sayoc was no stranger to law enforcement. And we're hearing from people who know him and his mother who lives in Aventura. CBS 4 News at 6 starts right now. This is CBS 4 News at 6. Now at 6, Caesar Sayoc taken into custody in Plantation. His van confiscated. Officials say he targeted critics of President Trump. They uncovered a latent fingerprint from one of the envelopes. We have confirmed this fingerprint is that of Caesar Sayoc. Tonight, the 56-year-old South Florida man arrested and charged. The story has, of course, been developing all day long. Tonight, Sayok is facing multiple federal crimes, crimes that could send him to prison for 48 years. Now, investigators say 13 bombs were sent to prominent Democrats. Every angle of the story is covered right now on CBS4 with a team of reporters fanned out across the area. We begin in Plantation, where the manhunt ended. CBS4's Ted Scouten is there live. Ted. Ruta Van Elliott, one of the big questions right now the FBI still has not addressed is what was he doing here in Plantation in the parking lot here at this auto zone? At this point, we don't know, but it was here in this parking lot where he was taken down about 11 o'clock this morning. Yeah, we just took him into custody. Um, we're concerned reference signal 46. It was about 11 o'clock this morning when 56 year old Caesar Sayoc was taken into custody in the parking lot of an auto zone store on Save Road 7 in Plantation. Watch a surveillance video on the top of the screen. That flash appears to be the moment a flashbang went off. It's a loud explosion that stuns someone, giving police time to move in. As I turned, I heard a very loud bang. Um, it absolutely appeared to be uh, a flashbang. Noticed probably 40, 50 law enforcement officers come out from all different directions. Sayak was arrested by his van. It's plastered with pro-Trump, anti-Democrat stickers. The FBI loaded that van onto its flatbed to bring it to their Miramar headquarters for analysis. Meanwhile, an FBI agent remained inside the auto zone trying to get more information from clerks. These are not hoax devices. FBI Director Christopher Wray confirmed that these are actual pipe bombs describing the material used to make them. Each device consisted of roughly six inches of PVC pipe, a small clock, a battery, some wiring, and what is known as energetic material, which is essentially potential explosives and material that give off heat and energy. He would not get into what a possible motive was, but said he was led to Sayoc from DNA and a fingerprint left on one of 13 devices he suspected of sending. They uncovered a latent fingerprint from one of the envelopes containing an IED that had been sent to Congresswoman Maxine Waters. We have confirmed this fingerprint is that of Cesar Sayoc. 
There is also a possible DNA connection between samples collected from pieces of two different IEDs mailed in separate envelopes and a sample previously collected from SAOC in connection with an earlier arrest down in Florida. Now the FBI also gave a bit of an ominous warning saying we may not be out of the woods yet and then went on to say that they don't know if there could be other devices that are still in the mail right now. Uh, the suspect is due in federal court on Monday to face five charges. If convicted of all these, he could face up to 48 years in federal prison. Live in Plantation, Ted Scout, CBS4 News. Ted, thank you. And tonight we're learning more about Sayok's troubling past. He is no stranger to crime or to law enforcement. CBS4's David Sutta has been digging into his criminal history. David is live at FBI headquarters in Miramar with what he's learned. David. Yeah, we're learning a lot. This uh, gentleman is actually trending right now on social media as the Make America Great Again bomber or MAGA bomber. As we looked into his history, it is clear that he is an avid uh, supporter of Donald Trump, a right wing, uh, a f a basically someone who's crazy about that side. He shows up to rallies. He shows up at uh, Trump's mansion up in Palm Beach and uh, did it many times. Uh, if you were driving down the road and you saw a van covered in stickers, that would be him. A lot of people posted on social social media about him. And it was that criminal history, a criminal history here in South Florida that brought all of this to a close today. As the Attorney General has confirmed, we have arrested Cesar Sayoc in connection with this investigation. 56-year-old Cesar Sayoc lives in Aventura. He's held a number of jobs over the years as an inspiring entrepreneur. On social media, he routinely posted right-wing comments and photos. He went to Donald Trump rallies. He constantly bashed Democrats. If he drove by you, you could not miss him. His van covered in right-wing stickers. Those who knew him well say he was certainly passionate about politics. Every conversation we ever had rolled right back into politics, no matter what subject it started on. It was always Politics. Justin Humberger speaking to us by phone used Tayok as a business manager a couple years ago. His views are, yes, very Republican and very, very right leaning, but it's never come to like an, where he's threatened anybody or an act of violence. He's like, these people should die because of their views or the policies they're instating. Humberger sent us screenshots of texts Sayok had sent him recently, one featuring a photo of him holding an I voted sticker and making a statement supporting Republican candidates Rick Scott and Ron DeSantis. In another text, Sayok actually sent a link to a news story about one of the pipe bombs he allegedly sent to a Democratic supporter, George Soros. I don't expect him to have the technical skill to, to create a device that, to, to kill people. Sayok has a history of arrest, including grand theft, battery, and possession of prescription drugs with intent to sell. In 2002, he was arrested when, according to police, he, quote, threatened to blow up FPL and that it would be worse than September 11th. He also threatened something would happen to the FPL representative if they cut his electricity. Sayok was sentenced to one year of probation. Ultimately, its fingerprints recorded during those previous arrests that linked him to the pipe bomb packages. Once a fingerprint was found on one of those devices and run, the FBI we're on to him. And we're learning through various sources now reporting about Cesar Soak. Uh, apparently uh, had been kicked out of his house by his parents uh, and wasn't in a good relationship any longer with his mother. Uh, apparently it may have been politics involved in that issue and that he had been living in his van. Uh, earlier today he was apparently cooperating with uh, authorities, but in fact he actually told them, according to what we're hearing from the investigators, is that the uh, pipe bombs wouldn't have hurt anyone and that he didn't want to hurt anyone. However, uh, a short time ago, Ago, we learned that he was no longer cooperating and actually had uh, has his own representation, his own attorney now. He's expected to be in federal court on Monday uh, morning or afternoon. We're still waiting on the details of that. We're live in Miramar, David Sutter, CBS 4 News. All right, David, thank you for that. Tonight we're hearing from people who know Sayak and his mother. His mother lives in Aventura, and that's where CBS 4's Peter Dench picks up our team coverage. Peter. Well, Rota Bay, it's been a busy day today here at Caesar Sayak's last known address. There have been new developments in the past few hours. Now, let's take a look right now at what we saw from Chopper 4. FBI agents are seen leaving this condominium complex on uh, Northeast 181st Street late this afternoon. Sayak's last known address is a condo we saw on the 20th floor. It's where his mother is a well-known member of the board of directors. 
Condominium owners I spoke with did not recall seeing 56-year-old mail bomb suspect Caesar Sayok at their complex. But records show this building in Northeast 181st Street and 31st Court in Aventura was his last known address until two years ago, inside of apartment number 2016. This condo owner, who also lives on the 20th floor, took us there. We tried to see if anyone was at home. While no one was there, many here were talking about the arrest of Caesar Sayok. It's very sad. It's very sad. It seemed many condo owners know his mother, Madeline Giardello. And what is she She's like? a very nice lady. She's so perfect. I'm in shock right now uh -huh. because I did not know any of this information. I know yeah. Madeline as the president or used to be the president. Sayok's mother had been president of the condo association and is still on the board of directors. The mother has served that building well for the last 18 years on the board. She's been president of the board for a number of years, and uh, she's a nice woman. I mean, she just, uh, you know, this is just a, a happenstance that this is her, uh, allegedly, her son. So, What are your feelings about this whole thing, what the son is allegedly it's tied to? It's crazy. I don't know. I never saw him, but, you know, it's crazy. It's absolutely unbelievable. Now, we were not able to reach Sayak's mother. We were told she's been hospitalized for surgery. Meanwhile, some condo residents told us they'd also seen FBI agents here earlier this week. We were not able to confirm that or determine if it was, in fact, connected to Sayak. We're live in Aventura. Peter Danch, CBS 4 News. Peter, thank you very much. And our team covered this now to Opelaka and the mail distribution facility there that just 24 hours ago became the focus of the investigation. CBS 4's Gary Nelson is there live with details on the discovery made there. Gary. Well, as David Sada reported, this fellow was talking freely with FBI agents right after he was uh, arrested uh, this afternoon. And very shortly after that, the Miami-Dade Police Department's bomb squad showed back up at this mail distribution center. Miami-Dade police and bomb squad members back at an Opelaka mail processing center scarcely three hours after the suspect in the bomb device mailings was captured. It is at this mail sorting center that investigators believe some, maybe all of the devices were processed and sent on their way. Dogs and bomb squad teams spent much of Thursday and overnight scouring the massive mail facility. In a news conference after the suspect's arrest, the FBI director cautioned there might be more devices still, well, in the mail. Today's arrest doesn't mean we're all out of the woods. There may be other packages in transit now. Overnight, a device was intercepted at the center addressed to a Democratic New Jersey senator who's been critical of President Trump. And Friday, with the suspect in custody, bomb experts returned to the mail center in Opelaka, presumably looking to find any more pipe bombs that might be in the pipeline. And behind me here, there are still two Miami-Dade Police Department bomb squad vehicles, bomb squad personnel still on the scene here. The question is, are there more devices to be found? We are live in Opelika. Gary Nelson, CBS 4 News. Gary, thank you. As we've been reporting, investigators are saying at least 13 devices were sent targeting prominent opponents of President Trump. Since Monday, these packages have been delivered or intercepted in New York, Washington, California, and here in South Florida. Four of them were found today, including a package addressed to New Jersey Senator Cory Booker, intercepted in Opelika. Another, found in a New York mail facility, was addressed to former Director of National Security James Clapper at CNN headquarters in California. Billionaire donor Tom Steyer and Senator Kamala Harris also received packages. President Trump today reacting to the arrest of Cesar Sayoc, speaking at a leadership summit, summit for conservative black youth. Mr. Trump condemned the bomb mailings, calling them terrorizing acts and saying they need to stop. We must never allow political violence to take root in America. Cannot let it happen. And I'm committed to doing everything in my power as president to stop it. The president also calling for Americans to come together and show the world that the country is united. Sayok has been charged with five federal crimes, including threats to two former U.S. presidents.
Coming up at 7, we'll speak to former assistant U.S. attorney David Weinstein about the possibility of Sayoc facing even more charges. That's all new tonight at 7. And, of course, look for extensive coverage on the arrest of Cesar Sayoc on the CBS Evening News with Jeff Glor. That's at 6.30 after CBS 4 News at 6. And still ahead here at 6, what Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz is saying about Cesar Sayoc's arrest. We're also covering other news for you. Republican gubernatorial nominee Ron DeSantis in South Florida right now. A live report from High Aaliyah coming up. And a tough loss for the Finns last night in Houston. What head coach Adam Gase is saying about that today later in sports. We had near record heat today and still warm tomorrow with the upper 80s. The cold front sweeps in and brings our temperatures down. Highs will be struggling to reach 80 by Sunday and then it'll gradually start to warm up. But lows will be in the 60s for some time. I'll break it down in my complete forecast straight ahead. I'm Maribel Rodriguez. Here at CBS4, we want to help you get ready to vote. And all this month, we will break down the amendments on the ballot. So let's talk about Amendment 7. It's three proposals in one. A yes vote will require for state and local governments to pay death benefits to the survivors of first responders and military members. Florida already provides these benefits, but will now include paramedics, emergency medical technicians, and U.S. military service members who live here. Require a nine-member vote of the Board of Trustees and 12 member vote of the Board of Governors to increase college fees, not including tuition. And it will establish the existing Florida college system as a constitutional entity. Voting no on Amendment 7 will continue allowing universities to increase student fees or impose new ones with a simple majority of votes. Continue providing death benefits for first responders through state law rather than making it a part of the Constitution. And continue providing death benefits to the families of national National Guardsmen who are killed in the line of duty, but not extend those benefits to the families of U.S. service members who live in Florida. Those are your quick facts on Amendment 7. Head to the election guide on our website, CBSMiami.com, where we break down all the amendments for you. I'm Maribel Rodriguez.
Our coverage of the arrest of Caesar Sayoc continues with Florida Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz. Her name and address were used by the person who sent the suspicious devices. She wasn't at her office when a device addressed to former Attorney General Eric Holder was delivered, but she says she is heartbroken that her staff had to deal with it. At a voting event earlier today, the Congresswoman also saying she does not know why she was targeted and that we need to be resilient. We are not going to be knocked down by violence and by vitriol and by venom. In a statement issued later in the day, the Congresswoman also thanked law enforcement. And out of campaign 2018 and the race for governor, just 11 days now until the general election. Republican gubernatorial nominee Ron DeSantis is in South Florida right now. And CBS 4's Hank Tester is live in Hialeah with details. Hank. Well, the candidate took time out to praise law enforcement for taking down the bomber. And then he launched into an attack against Andrew Gillum. Along the way, he picked up a lot of support from local Hispanic political leaders. Here's the story. ¿Dónde es? ¿Qué eso va a parar? ¿Dónde? En Hialeah. So let me just tell, let me just tell Ron DeSantis, we've seen, we've seen this new aggressive radical left. The Ron DeSantis campaign trotted out Miami-Dade political heavyweights to boost his campaign. The critical Hispanic vote he needs to defeat Andrew Gillum. Ladies and gentlemen, the next governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. DeSantis wasted no time in tossing red meat to the crowd in this packed Hialeah Cuban restaurant. We cannot let Andrew Gillum impose left-wing policies on the state of Florida. They haven't worked elsewhere. They're not going to work here. DeSantis promised to protect Florida's current corporate tax structure, said only he would be able to work with the Trump administration, but he drove home his concern that his opponent is way to the left. Socialism hasn't worked in Venezuela. It hasn't worked in Cuba. It hasn't worked in Nicaragua. It ain't going to work in the state of Florida. Well, DeSantis did tell the crowd here at Chico's restaurant he can't wait for the day that he can go to Cuba, a free Cuba. That's the very latest. I'm Hank Tester, CBS News. Back to you. Thank you, Hank. Democratic gubernatorial nominee Andrew Gillum is on the road in North Florida today. If Gillum was in South Florida yesterday if making a number of stops as part of his ongoing bus tour. Today, he's making stops in Tallahassee, Gainesville, and Daytona Beach. And we have some new numbers in tonight for early voting in Florida, and they're pretty impressive. In-person early voting began in South Florida this past Monday, and as of this morning, more than 66,000 people have cast ballots in Miami-Dade. More than 68,000 have done so in Broward and more than 3,000 in Monroe County. Statewide, more than 2 million people have voted either in person or by mail. And so far, Republicans have the edge by about 62,000 votes. In-person early voting continues until a week from Sunday in Miami-Dade and Broward and a week from Saturday in Monroe County. For polling locations and much more, go to our website, cbsmiami.com slash election guide. And join us for a special one-hour live election edition of Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy on Sunday morning beginning at 8. Well, the weekend is here. And finally here. The weather Hard is improving <laughs> drastically, Lisette Gonzalez. Yes, and it will finally feel more like fall by the time Sunday rolls around. So good evening to all of you. Happy Friday as we look from our Fort Lauderdale camera, Broward County. The sun's starting to set. It is gorgeous out there. Miami hit a high of 89 degrees, a degree shy of the record. Fort Lauderdale 88, Key West 87, but I spy a cold front moving across the Big Bend and behind it already some cooler air is sweeping in across the Big Bend and the Panhandle especially. 67 in Pensacola, 76 in Tallahassee out ahead of that front. We are still very warm with the mid to upper 80s in the wind out of the west. Southwest 10, 17 miles an hour and that first front is going to move in. Tomorrow morning it could bring some showers, especially for the first half of the day. But then by tomorrow night into Sunday morning, we'll wake up to the 60s. It'll feel crisp and refreshing. And then a secondary week front arrives next week. Now for tonight, mild clouds building 74 with a chance for some spotty showers. Small craft caution for boaters winds southwest 10 to 20 knots, seas 2 to 3, a light chop on the bays. And tomorrow, again, scattered showers and warm, then mostly sunny with highs in the upper 80s. So the winds start off out of the west, but once the front 
front clears. They're shifting more out of the northwest, eventually the north, and that will bring our temperatures down to the 60s. Sunny morning may even break out a light sweater. And by the afternoon, it'll be pleasant with lower humidity and the high around 80. Some areas could be in the upper 70s Sunday. Monday morning, a little cooler with 65, and then highs will continue in the low 80s. And Tuesday, temperatures begin to climb a little. 69, the low on Tuesday morning, the high 83. By Wednesday for Halloween, 84 degrees. Thank you, Lissette. Tonight in sports, Dolphins head coach Adam Gase on another loss. And the Canes in action tonight. Sports is next. Mike is here in that game yesterday. Some questionable decisions by the coaching staff. Oh, questionable yeah. decisions by the coaching staff, questionable plays by the players. A lot to work on. They have a few extra days before the next game, so we'll see if they get it straightened out. This Dolphins team that was once 3-0 and to start the season has come crashing back down to earth. They are now 4-4 four and four halfway through the year. The sideline blowup of defensive coordinator Matt Burke basically sums up a frustrating night for the Finns. Miami allowed 427 total yards, 188 of those coming on the ground. This was the third time this season Miami gave up more than 30 points and the fifth time an opponent has gained more than 400 yards leading many to wonder if Burke's job is in jeopardy. Matt Burke's job security that's not something that's ruled out as a, as a topic. I haven't even thought about that in my head. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that you know I don't see that happening. I'm just we need to go back and figure out what is going on to where we're giving up these massive amounts of yardage in the run game. Well, last week, Devontae Parker's agent, Jimmy Gould, called Adam Gase incompetent for making Parker a healthy scratch against the Lions. Well, his client backed up all that big talk last night with a career game, racking up 134 yards on six catches, proving he has value in this Dolphins offense. I already know who I am as a player, you know. I know I was, 
I'm still, I'm still, I still got the talent, you know, and I'm just use whatever I can just to help the team. That's it. Friday Night Lights will be reserved for college football as the Canes try to bounce back from that loss to Virginia. Malik Rozier is getting the start against Boston College. Kickoff is about 35 minutes away. An update on the never-ending Jimmy Butler trade saga. Last night, ESPN was reporting that the Rockets were offering the Timberwolves four first-round picks for the All-Star forward. Today, Five Reasons Sports, as well as ESPN, are now saying the Heat are back at the negotiating table with Minnesota trying to get that all-star oh, forward. Who do forward. we give up? Well, the talks would be before was uh, Josh Richardson, maybe a first-round pick, uh, might be Kelly Olenek, a couple different variations there. So. We'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. right, yeah. well, thank you. Right. We'll be right back. Tonight on the CBS Evening News, we have correspondents in South Florida, D.C., and New York with new details on the arrest of Caesar Sayoc today, the man accused of sending those bombs and suspicious packages around the country, how the investigation unfolded, how the arrest was made, what's inside all of these packages, and what comes next. Also, she made a little girl's Cinderella fantasy come true. Steve Hartman has that story on the road. That is tonight on the CBS Evening News.